Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you all. Since we all get last gathered, Nelson Mandela has passed away. Let's take a moment to remember, to remember this extraordinary man, the man black South, black South Africans called Madiba, which was his clan name and a term of deep respect. Nelson Mandela has inspired many of us. I know for me personally, meeting Nelson Mandela and talking with him was one of the great honors of my life. And his autobiography, Long Walk to Freedom, is a gold mine of inspiration. He reminds us, quote, there is no passion in settling for a life that is less than the one you are capable of living. In the struggle to overthrow apartheid, Nelson Mandela faced dangers and overwhelming odds that are hard for us to comprehend today. And yet, we can draw lessons from his life that relate directly to our lives as educators. The old teacher in me doesn't want to lose those lessons. Nelson Mandela understood that no one individual, however brave, could bring equal opportunity and justice to South Africa. It would take collective action. Quote, I can pinpoint a moment when I became politicized, when I knew that I would spend my life in the liberation struggle. Nelson wrote that in the Long Walk to Freedom. He said to be an African in South Africa means that one is politicized from the moment of one's birth, whether one acknowledges it or not. You know, it strikes me that to be an educator today is what is to become politicized, whether one acknowledges it or not. The resources available to us to educate our students are determined by the political process. And people who know very little about what we do or how we do it often impose controls on us that, as educators, make no sense. That is why we have to gain control of our profession. Nelson Mandela was a huge advocate for educators and education his entire life. His parents, neither of whom could read or write, taught young Nelson Mandela the value of education. His aunt, his aunt Hathew, who was illiterate, scrutinized his homework every night, much like Barack Obama's mother scrutinized his homework. Nelson Mandela would later say, Ed education is the great engine of personal development. It is through education that the daughter of a peasant can become a doctor, that the son of a mine worker can become the head of the mine, that a child of farm workers can become the president of a great nation. Nelson Mandela remembered the names of every one of his teachers because they had taken such an interest in him. Not because he was the cleverest boy in the class, he wasn't, but because he was so determined to learn. As an adult, Nelson Mandela worried, though, just as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did, about the impact of poverty on students and their families. And like Dr. King, he talked about the, quote, the curse of poverty. Nelson Mandela said, overcoming poverty is not a task of charity. It is an act of justice. Like slavery and apartheid, poverty is not natural. It is man-made and can be overcome and eradicated by the action of human beings. This rings true to us today as we see more and more students, students from poor families, pour into our schools. Imagine what a difference it would make in our society if there were a political consensus around the proposition that overcoming poverty is not a task of charity, but an act of justice. And like Dr. King, Nelson Mandela never bought in today's reigning economic theory that the free market, unfettered by regulation, would bring prosperity to everyone.
If the claim that everyone can be rich and successful provided they work hard was true, Nelson Mandela noted, how is it that millions who work themselves to the bone still remain impoverished? Although his white oppressors in South Africa, as well as a number of right-wing politicians in the United States, accused Nelson Mandela of being a communist, he never was. Like us, he cherished the ideal of a democratic and free multiracial society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunity. Nelson Mandela believed that a nation should be judged not by how it treats its most privileged citizens, but by how it treats its poorest and neediest citizens. This extraordinary man, this extraordinary man, Nelson Mandela, loved life. He loved his children and his wife. But at the age of 46, he became prisoner number 466-64. And for the next 27 years, he remained a prisoner, locked up under the very harsh conditions of Robin Island. For him, the hardest part of incarceration was separation from his family. He lamented that he never got to see his children grow up or hold his grandchildren on his lap. What's more, his marriage fell apart during those 27 long years. He said, there were many dark moments when my faith in humanity was sorely tested. But I would not and could not give myself up to despair. That way lay defeat and death. But as grim and oppressive as Robben Island was, it became known as the university. The university in the liberation movement because of what Nelson Mandela and his fellow freedom fighters learned from each other. They became their own faculty with their own professors, their own curriculum, and their own courses. When Nelson Mandela was, Mandela was leaving prison for the last time, he confronted the hatred within himself for his oppressors. He said, I realized that when I went through that gate, if I still hated them, they would still have me. I wanted to be free, and so I let it go. And when the, and when the prisoner became president of his nation, he did not allow hatred to rule. He focused on making South Africa's multiracial society work averting what could have been a very bloody civil war. He did so, however, without ever compromising his basic principles. For him, the right of every South African to vote, regardless of race, was non-negotiable, and he insisted every South African child have access to public education. My friends, my friends as we work to make our society more just, and more democratic. Nelson's, Mandela's lessons will serve us well. We must never give in to despair or hatred, even after a defeat. We must always be there for one another, boosting each other's spirits. We must maintain the courage of our convictions to meet the challenges that confront us. May our actions tell America who we are and what kind of society we seek for ourselves and our students. From the bottom of our hearts, we thank you, Nelson Mandela. Now let me wrap up this portion of the program with a very special memory. After Nelson Mandela was released from prison, he traveled to Europe and the United States to thank the anti-apartheid movement that had been so instrumental in loosening the white Africanist grip on South Africa. He came to Washington, D.C. There hadn't been much time to plan for the event, so a large open area in the old Washington Convention Center was secured, and hundreds of people crowded in to see and to hear the free Nelson Mandela. Many of those people were from labor unions, asked me, SEIU, UFCW, AFT, and of course NEA, which had been a proud partner in the anti-apartheid movement. 
Nelson Mandela was introduced by Mary Frances Berry, the longtime civil rights advocate and anti-apartheid agitator. The air was electric with anticipation. There were no chairs, so everyone was standing. Mary Frances Berry urged everyone to look around the room. And then she asked that all those who had gone to jail protesting apartheid to raise their hands. A surprising number of hands went up. Then she asked all who, who had demonstrated at the South Af African Embassy to raise their hands. And many more hands shot up. Then she asked everyone who had written their elected representative demanding the United States boycott South African goods to raise their hands. Still more hands went up. Indeed, by this time, the room was a forest of raised arms. Look around, my brothers and sisters, Mary Frances Berry said, and savor the moment. This is how we create change. And a roar went up from that crowd. Then a white-haired man who had sacrificed so much stepped up to the microphone. He was wearing the most beautiful smile from ear to ear you have ever seen. And without ever losing that smile, he slowly raised his right fist. And the people, many of them, with tears in their eyes, raised their fist. The struggle from freedom was far from over. But we have prevailed this time. And this extraordinary man known as Madiba had inspired us all. My brothers and sisters, please raise your fist if you believe in justice for all and a great public school for every student. Now please stand up and raise your fist if you are prepared to turn your passion for justice into action. Look around and take heart. Our case is powerful, and Nelson Mandela is smiling down upon us this evening. Thank you all.